फोर थ्री टू वन सर बी आर लाइव नाउ ओके सो गुड इवनिंग एवरीबडी एंड वेलकम टू दिस सुपर स्पाइन सेशन ऑफ यू एस राइजिंग स्टार uh to introduce the session and to introduce the judges i like to call upon to dr dhar sir president of bombay orthopedic society over to you sir hi good evening everyone welcome again uh, to this i think this is the third session now third edition of this uh, bios rising star today we have all the contestants who are going to present on spine topic because they have chosen this topic of spine and we have uh, uh, various participants um, for that i'll try to introduce my judges uh, who for this today we have judges varying from uh, as senior as dr vt ingal halikar who has been my teacher and who has taught me spine who is there with us for today we have dr satyan mehta who is uh, one of the top spine surgeons of the city and we have dr uh, deeraj deeraj is there no deeraj sunawni yes, yes. who is also a spine surgeon and associate professor in jj hospital and we have dr deeren ganjawala who is uh, well known for uh, um, as a faculty for uh, how you uh, t uh, make these slides and all that he will be there to judge you on the presentation skills as well besides ashok and dr neeraj is there and i will also be there so uh, the participant i think ashok you will introduce uh, neeraj will introduce i welcome uh, dr vt ingal alikar dr satyan mehta dr deeraj and dr deeren ganjawala to this session thank you sir as you all know this uh, this is all basically to up, um, uh, give a venue uh, for young budding surgeons orthopedic surgeons who are less than 5 years post ms and to enhance and train them for presentations and probably have our own future faculty ready second third generation uh, and i think bios wants to promote these youngsters uh, i'm sure we'll have a great um, session today also so over to dr neeraj thank you very much we welcome all of you today speakers and the rising stars of the bombay orthopedic society uh welcome uh this is the spine session as dr sanjay there has already uh, introduced so i would like to introduce today's star speakers who are the rising stars of bos dr sushant srivastava he is going to talk on lumbar spondylolisthesis dr maitreya patel is going to talk on adjacent segment disease dr priyam bada kumar she is going to talk on spinal tuberculosis dr ashish nayak is going to talk on vertebroplasty and kyphoplasty and dr kushal goel who is going to talk on laminectomy versus laminoplasty with this i hand over back to dr ashok sham to start the session all the best thank you dr sir and neeraj and i welcome all our judges again uh, to the contestants the rules are simple you have a 8 minute presentation and 2 minutes question answer session i'll be timing the presentations and i'll announce the time that you took at the end of your presentation so that you just know how much time you take So let's begin with our first uh, contestant, Dr. Sushant Srivastava. Sushant, you can start sharing your screen. Start screen. Sorry. Yeah. Sir, so is my screen visible? Yes, your screen is visible. Go ahead, Sushant. Okay. A very good evening to everyone. Uh, I am Dr. Sushant Srivastava. My topic for today is surgical treatment of lumbar spondylolisthesis, current approaches and outcomes. but before we start with this let us talk or see the burning debates related to lumbar spondylolisthesis the addition of fusion to decompression non inflammatory fusion versus minimally invasive surgery interbody versus no interbody fusion and which interbody approach to use as these are the burning issues let us follow a outline or guideline for this so we will go through the history the introduction the methodology to search the literature pearls of the literature review take home message and the references so if you look at history spondylolisthesis comes from the greek term spondylo which means spine and olisthesis which means slip right from 1741 from the age of nicholas andre to 1855 roberts people have tried 
to give their own meaning and definition of spondylolisthesis. The one which we commonly use these days are ventral or anterior displacement of one vertebra relative to the subjacent vertebra. The classifications are many, but the ones of use are one given by Wilsey that is type 1 dysplastic, type 2 isthmic, degenerative, traumatic, and pathologic. The ones given by Marchetti and Bortolozzi, developmental and acquired classification. Merding's grading of severity of slip in spondylolisthesis is graded as normal grade 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, depending on the slip of the vertebra over the adjacent vertebra. This is a schematic diagram showing how the measurements for the Merding classification are made. This example shows grade 2 slip that is between 26 to 50 percent. Spinopelvic alignment knowledge is very important to treat the case of lumbar spondylolisthesis. This is a heavy slide, but what I would like to drive home the point is pelvic incidence, which is very important, is defined as the angle which is subtended by a line which is drawn from the center of the femoral head to the midpoint of the sacral end plate and a line perpendicular to the central of the sacral end plate. So sacral slope and the pelvic tilt together give the sum of the pelvic incidence. The final classification, that is the spinal deformity study group classification, which actually classifies L5-S1 spondylolysis to low grade and high grade. The one which we need to understand here is type 6 is important and which needs surgical management. The methodology data mining was done using Google, Google Scholar, PubMed Advanced Search Builder, and Cochrane Library. There are a plethora of literature available on the net, but we used the basic thing called as the PubMed Advanced Boolean Operator and Mesh Findings, wherein I got 68 results. I used a normal use of words that is lumbar spondylolisthesis, surgical treatment, the two modalities of open surgery and minimal invasive surgery. Open surgery consisted of decompression, direct repair, interbody fusion versus MIS and the outcomes of each. Now, I have tried to place my talk depending on the debates. Now, the first is laminectomy plus fusion versus laminectomy alone for lumbar spondylolysis. This is a famous paper by Gogawala in the year 2016. This was a controlled trial of total 66 patients with spondylolysthesis from 3 to 14 mm, the fusion group had greater increase in the SF36 physical component summary. The cumulative rate of reoperation was less in the fusion group. The scores in the fusion group remained greater at four years interval. The ODI scores at two years after surgery did not differ significantly. Then comes comparison of instrumented versus non-instrumented fusion in the treatment of lumbar spondylolysthesis. No significant pain change was seen, neither was there any significant difference in satisfactory level for patients. But the higher fusion rate was the one thing which drove home the point of instrumented fusion. Minimal invasive surgery, vis a vis open surgery. Now, this was a quality outcome database done by Mumanini in 2019. Significant improvement was found in terms of all functional outcomes undergoing MIS with low mean intraoperative estimated blood loss and longer operative times, better ODI scores, and better NRS back pain and LP scores. There was no difference at one level fusion, but at the two level fusion, the MIS fusions were better. The posterior lateral fusion vis a vis the transforaminal lumbar interbody fusion. This was a study in 2018 consisting of 282 unique English language studies done by Levin. The pooled fusion success rates were less in the posterior lumbar fusion group than the T-lift group. The P-lift patients had significantly lower odds of achieving solid arthrodesis. The ODI scores were better at the T-lift time. Operative time was significantly shorter in the PLF group. There was no significant difference observed in leg pain. The meta-analysis of this study was consistent with the RCTs in favor of T-lift. This study, which is the summary of the treatment of lumbar spondylolysthesis, had a unique grade of recommendation consisting of grade A, B, C, and I, which gave ahead the good evidence fair and the conflicting evidence. There were 46 studies out of which 37 were used. The one which was peculiar here was the algorithm which they used for the surgical management of L5-S1 vertebra needing height restoration or lordosis 
If yes, one goes ahead and prefers a lift. In case of prior abdominal surgery, one goes ahead with T-LIF, L4, L5, need of foraminal distraction and revision, lateral lumbar interbody fusion, and the last, need of restoration of L3, L4 with prior, the goes to LTLF. So what are the pearls of wisdom in this pleothra of knowledge? Surgical decision is important, individualized for each patient, thinking of the natural progression of the disease, severity and duration of symptom, and the comorbidities. Surgical indications are severe back and leg pain, failed conservative trial, and abnormal neurology. Contraindications are active infection and life-threatening medical conditions. The surgical goal is to address the cause, decompress the foraminal stenosis, remove degenerated disc, if any, and correct the dynamic instability. Decompression absolute indication is abnormal neurology, leg pain, sphincter dysfunction, and claudication. No isolated decompression should be done as it may lead to pseudoarthrosis. Decompression with fusion can be done, but without decompression and fusion, vascular less than for low backache, translation of more than 1.25, angry facets more than 50 degrees, and disc height more than 6.5. Interbody fusion gives anterior column support, bioniconically superior, build the lordosis and indirect reduction. Posterior fusion, better fusion rate, better clinical outcome, and it is not good for osteoporotic bone. MIS is better with reduced price, shorter surgical duration, and hospital stay. The following are the complications of reoperation, incidental neurotomy, nerve root injury, and loosening of screws. So think the natural progression of the disease, severity of symptom, patient comorbidity, surgical skills of the patient. These are my references. Thank you. Thank you, Sushant. You finished exactly on time. And uh, let's open the forum uh, for judges to ask questions. So I'll invite uh, Ingalalikar, sir, for questions. Over to you, sir. Sushant. Good evening, uh, sir. How do you compare this with the neglected listesis? Those ones which have refused surgery and those ones which have progressed. Result point of view, are they all bad? Sir, if it is neglected, as far as I can uh, answer this to the best of my knowledge, uh, if it is neglected, that means the patient is not having any symptoms. The patient comes to us with a particular symptom or problem, and that is when he comes ahead for some intervention that can either be conservative or surgical. Okay. Do all of all of them worsen over time? Uh, in terms of symptoms and uh, grade of list? Yes, sir. Depending on the uh, the SDSG classification, that is type five, in which uh, the uh, in which the plane Uh, the balance, the retroverted pelvis has two types. That is the balanced spine and the unbalanced spine. So one which is having the unbalanced spine, patient reaching to this level, having uh, more of leg pain and back pain, having urological symptoms are the ones which deteriorate. Okay. So Dr. Satin, your questions? Yeah, thanks. Uh, Sushan, uh, I will go back to the beginning of this uh, now, the, you have chosen this topic, right? No, we have given them. They have chosen the section, the spine section and others. So, we okay. have given them the topic. Okay. Uh, I think, you know, the topic is very, uh, very, very, very big, very diverse topic. And uh, you have done very well to kind of uh, pick up the uh, points in this. Uh, what difficulty did you face in uh, preparing for this uh, topic? So the biggest difficulty was actually uh, cramming the um, large amount of 1,853 articles, which I found up till now. And the, the main problem was actually cramming all this piece of information within an in eight minute stop. So what I really felt was that uh, it would be pertinent and prudent enough to bring in the points which would be uh, yeah. problematic for a day-to-day -day orthopedic surgeon who is just into his clinical practice. Very good. I mean, uh, I minus points to Dr. Ashok Sham and uh, for plus points to you for doing this. And uh, uh, 
uh, tell me about uh, the uh, you mentioned goga was paper which is a very good paper um, what is the problem with that paper he has mentioned that it, that all of them you know okay i don't want to give too much out that basically not too much difference in surgical versus uh, non surgical but what is the problem in that paper uh sir the problem in that paper is uh to be uh do you remember yes sir see the basic thing which i remember is the odi scores which they say there is not much of a difference in the odi score as compared to the uh, uh the the laminectomy plus fusion versus laminectomy so there is not much of a difference between the odi scores that is what i remember sir. okay i'll tell you one more point maybe you have not missed it that he has uh, taken all of these listeses together overall between grade uh, with 3 mm to 14 mm so it's like a very generalized type of uh, thing where you're not really specifically looking at uh, anyways thank you well done thank you sir thank you sir thank sushant you, sir. sushant can i ask you one question you've gone through lots of papers uh, did you find so you're muted sir Uh, say reduction, no reduction. You have gone through lots of papers, yes, sir. And you have seen papers which are on any particular aspect. Say, for example, uh, reduction, no reduction. This fusion, that fusion. Did you find lots of paper opposing each other on the same aspect? Yes, yes, sir. There were a oh, lot of uh, contradictory papers. Lot of well. contradictory papers over any one single aspect, and I'm sure there are multiple aspects to this topic. Uh, how did you sort it that out? Okay, sir. So yes. there was one. Uh, there was one very good paper uh, which actually had a analysis of the past hundred year uh, meta analysis of the past hundred year publication of lumbar spondylolisthesis. so on, on, on the basis of that paper they had a list of the top 100 papers which had the maximum amount of citation index and i went through those papers and depending on those papers the topics which they uh, actually spoke about uh, i took them in this talk that's okay. it dr dheeraj your questions yeah uh, sujan uh, your presentation was uh, excellent i must say that uh but i i was just going through your slide i was very impressed uh, with the way you are presenting and one of the slide just hit me uh, you mentioned that there is no uh, no role of isolated decompression and uh, no isolated decompression should be done and uh, otherwise it will lead to pseudo arthrosis yeah so there is iso so yeah Yeah. Yeah, isolated yeah, Isol that was that was one mistake which i uttered sir actually the line should have been we can do isolated decompression but uh, isolated decompression the complication may the the complication for isolated decompression may be pseudo arthrosis that is what i okay. wanted to okay say. okay so even after your correction this is a wrong statement okay sir. because when we do only decompression we have not attempting fusion we are instead preserving the motion we want the motion to be there so why you are uttering the word pseudo arthrosis okay. you are already attempting to preserve the motion all right sir okay okay sir. second thing even in a stable listhesis you have not mentioned about that there is a role of decompression only i think vti sir will also agree and uh, add to this uh yeah if the listhesis is significant uh, that means all the structures both anterior as well as posterior lateral structures have grown incompetent and in order to do decompression if you have destabilized them further uh, that's not going to work that probably is not the way to go about therefore according to me any patient who has come to the stage of needing a surgery for listhesis probably unless there is a contraindication for fixation fusion decompression alone we have seen not doing too well for too long maybe year or two but they come back with radicular syndromes right uh, dhiran sir you have some comments questions yeah just the last question 
uh, are you wiser with your paper or with this study or you are more confused after so i have been this the, this whole uh, <clears throat> exercise of 5 6 days has given me more number of number of doubts and has actually made me open rathmin but uh, really i have i have learned a lot after doing this data mining and a few things which i used to think about in the or has been made clear with the data mining so yes it has made me wise so thanks yeah, i really man. appreciate in 5 6 days you have really worked very hard congratulations thank for you. that thank you sir thanks so in view of time i'll invite the second participant dr maitreya to share his screen and yes yes so he'll be presenting on adjacent segment disease yeah we can see your presentation okay sir so am i audible yes you are audible go ahead okay sir a uh, good evening respected faculty and all the delegates present i would like to thank the committee of bombay orthopedic society for giving me this prestigious opportunity for talk to today's talk i'll be talking about evaluation of the adjacent segment disease of the spine i'm dr maitreya patil and i'm a fellow in spine surgery at the spine clinic mumbai so coming to the introduction spinal fusion was first described by albe for the treatment of fourth disease who performed spinal fusion for the deformity and almost 50 <coughs> years ago cervical spinal fusion was described by bailey badgley robinson and smith so accordingly right now uh, along the few recent years because of increase in the fusion surgery there has been growth in adjacent segment disease of the spine adjacent segment degeneration relates to the radiographic changes which i have described with the help of a paper over here which are disc degeneration lysthesis herniated disc stenosis facetal hypertrophy scoliosis and compression fractures uh, for adjacent segment degeneration the radiographic guide is present here which i just mentioned uh, lorenz also suggested a term where the adjacent segment pathology can be considered which includes both clinical as well as radi radiological adjacent segment pathology coming to the methodology of my presentation i have done a thorough review of the lit literature from different journals including pubmed asian spine journal journal of orthopedic surgery and research and journal of korean library also cochrane library uh, i'll be presenting presenting my presentation in the following order with description starting with the anatomy so uh, basically an overview of the anatomy of the facet and intervertebral disc it basically forms a tripod between a facets and intervertebral disc the facets may later degenerate due to constant motion of the cartilage the following risk factors were stated out by the conduction of department of spine surgery in china these uh, risk factors are as follows so older the age group higher the bo uh, body mass index and any history of smoking or hypertension can lead to uh, earlier uh, degeneration of adjacent segments any pre operative evaluation of adjacent disc degeneration degeneration long segment fusions pre operative superior facet violations a high lumbosacral joint angle any pre existing degeneration and pre op and post op sagittal vertical axis can also lead to ast um then after that we come to the main causes of ast we start with the anatomy disruption of the adjacent to prior to the surgical level this is due to mostly a soft tissue disruption to the adjacent level of the uh, surgery and after that we come to interdiscal pressure to the adjacent to the surgical level later on sagittal alignment and posture so um, a study has notably given us that a large pelvic incidence angle and a smaller lumbar lordotic angle are associated with a greater risk of adjacent segment disease finally um, we have also have increased stress on the adjacent segments any altered biomechanics for the spine or the hardware fail hardware failure such as screws rods or plates they may fail and cause ir irritation to the adjacent segment a biological factors some which uh, come into play such as obesity smoking poor nutrition and finally aging processes a few clinical features which i can mention are pain radiation of the pain joint stiffness uh, any numbness and tingling sensation muscular weakness changes in gait loss of, of bowel and or bladder in severe cases increased pain with activity and decreased quality of life coming to the diagnosis for the adjacent segment disease we basically consider a clinical evaluation where we take the detailed medical history followed with a physical examination which includes to assess the range of the motion muscles and reflexes or any signs of nerve compression after that we come to the uh, symptom assessment where a questionnaire about the pain symptoms or numbness can be done 
followed by the location of uh, the location severity and duration of the factors that aggravate or worsen the pain. Uh, coming to imaging studies, uh, I've described a few X-rays and MRI and CT scan over here. So over here, we can see an X-ray of the lumbosacral spine in the lateral view, where an uh, L3, L4 single level T lift has been done, and the segment between L4, L5, and L5, S1 has undergone into adjacent segment disease. Coming to the treatment part, the treatment uh, basically starts always with conservative management, which involves physical therapy to improve strength, flexibility, and posture, which may help and reduce the pain and improve spinal stability. Medications can be NSAIDs or any muscle relaxants. Epidural steroid injections, which cause temporary relief by reducing inflammation and pain in the affected area. Lifestyle man modifications include weight reduction, smoking cessation, and activity modification. Uh, coming to the pain management, uh, it's still very controversial. It can include chiropractic care or TENS. And uh, finally, a few biological injections such as platelet plasma or stem cells and rehabilitation program uh, such as core and back strengthening exercises. Other modalities of treatment may include minimally invasive procedures and revision surgeries such as removal or replacement of hardware, extension of fusion to include the adjacent segment or segments, uh, any decompression of nerve root and artificial disc replacement. Here we can see an uh, L3, L4, and L5 uh, level fusion done, but the L2, L3 segment has developed adjacent segment, which was later on fixed by placement of a cage. Complications in, in, involve as chronic pain, decreased or reduced mobility leading to difficulty in bending, twisting, or lifting, any neurological deficits because of nerve compression, Reduced quality of life due to dependency of, of pain medications. Any revision surgery complications, which can be infection, bleeding, or hardware failure. A few recent advances which we can uh, come across are a few biomarkers seen in the CSF. Uh, Platelet-rich plasma to promote tissue regeneration and healing. Improved techniques for 3D and dynamic imaging. And finally, advanced implant materials can be total disc replacement for lumbar and cervical spine cage made up of titanium alloy or carbon fiber or peak and prosthetic nucleus replacement, dynamic stabilization, interspinous devices and facet replacement. To conclude, a recap of a few points uh, can be done. ASD can occur after spinal surgery adjacent to the surgical site. Maintaining posterior tension band is necessary. The risk of ASD can be reduced by medical dissection of the tissue during the surgery. pre of findings of uh, ASD can be looked after before the fusion of segments. A normal spinopelvic balance is also necessary. Coming to a short case discussion, we have an MRI which shows 49-year-old male with L5-S1 lumbar disc herniation and degeneration of L4-L5 intervertebral disc. You can see in the A and B images. After that, the C and D images show that the patient has gone a single level TLF of L5-S1, followed by he developed uh, an adjacent segment disease in L4-L5, which had to be revised later on. A study that shows that non-instrumented lumbar fusions had incidence of ASD up to 5.6%, whereas instrumented lumbar fusions had 18.5%. Comparison between AF um, of ASD between MIST lift and open TLF did not significantly differ. And ASD after PLIF with 10 years follow-up in 101 patients showed that three operations were in total of 10%, 10 patients, 80% of which were performed within post-op years. These are my references. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Maitre. You finished in seven minutes, 30 seconds. So now let's open to the judges. Singhal Alikar, sir, please go ahead with the question. Uh, Maitre, can you tell me uh, how long does it take for adjacent segment to become yes. diagnosably symptomatic after the surgery, index surgery? Yes. How so, much time should it take normally? So uh, generally, this patient starts developing symptoms from the period of three to five years, and they can aggravate after that, sir. What if it starts in six months or one year? So, so uh, that could be the case, sir. No, what does that mean? Um, so a thorough a preventive ASD evaluation was not done preoperatively. And... Oh, what is the thorough preventive evaluation? Uh, so we should check for the uh, dynamic uh, segments, sir, where the mobile segments of spine exist 
if in case a patient is undergoing a long segment fuse, uh, fusion or a segment fixation so the segment should be extended one level above the mobile segments that is for example from L L1 to S1 then we can extend it to D11 to S1 sir and also the spino pelvic parameter should need to be considered a uh, peculiar that, that you told us that that yes, you have told us yes one so thing is to be done but yes. after having patient having developed that you showed one case where three four fusion was done yes sir yes. and four five underwent asd and yes. five s1 also went asd yes now can you really call five s1 as asd or oh, it was a plain simple process of progressive degeneration which probably existed you also showed another case where yes. after l5 s1 fusion four five showed herniated, herniated. down going disc Yes. There are a lot of modic changes pre-operatively. Yes. Are these to be truly termed as ASDs? Uh, no, sir. I would uh, term them as degenerative changes. They were degenerative, which is already existing. Existing, right. And you also said that not disturbing the soft tissues of adjacent segment. What, right. the, what does that mean? Uh, so basically, uh, reevaluate and check on the MRI to see if, in case the, the disc is already degenerated, then we can plan for a uh, instrumentation or a uh, left out leave alone, and keep the uh, dissection as minimal as possible. So avoid any superior facet violation or uh, anything like that. What What is the commonest way of violating facet? Uh, sir, uh, in case of a posterior lumbar interbody fusion. So in case uh, during laminectomy or decompression, if the extension is more lateral uh, towards the facets and so that time the facet can get violated or even during instrumentation. Sir. What about facet capsule? You will most commonly remove the facet capsules. Yes, sir. yes sir. we shouldn't. Also, if your point of entry is too medial. Yes, sir. Then again, you can damage facet. If yes. you're sufficiently lateral, right at the base of transverse process, yes, probably those will be spared. Yes. You also know that uh, very often in a spondylolisthesis, the pain is not arising from that segment. segment. Very often it's arising from the upper facet, yes. which is the primary source of pain. Right, sir. Therefore, preoperatively, I think giving differential blocks at various levels at different sittings. Right. And evaluating, noting it down, and then finally doing the surgery, fixation, whatever segments, is, is a better way of doing. Right, sir. I agree. Right, sir. Uh, Dr. Satyan, your questions? Yeah, thanks. Uh, so, Ashish, a good presentation. Uh, I'll just uh, ask you a couple of sh short questions. Um, about uh, what is the role for dynamic stabilization in preventing ASD? Uh, so in dynamic stabilization, we uh, use motion segment rods uh, with allow motion of the segment when the patient is bending or going back. So it has a the connecting rod and the um, pedicle screw has motion segments going on in it. So it does it what help to like? prevent ASD? Is there uh, yes, a sir. study to so? yes sir yes sir it it does help to prevent ASD sir. Is that confirmed is or it's a speculation? Uh, so it's a speculation which uh, is still under review, sir. Okay, okay, not sure about uh, it. Yeah. Take care, take care. Do, do you uh, have any all. idea how long does an implant of a flexible implant last in a youngster like you? Um, so no, sir. I don't know, sir. Okay. That's all. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Dheeraj, your questions? Unmute yourself. Dheeraj, your <laughs> what what sir has asked is to the point even yes. if the adjacent segment degeneration risk is slightly less with this motion preserving devices the reoperation rate is much higher right okay hence the longevity for such dynamic uh, implants is an issue sure. okay so right. my yeah so my question to you what what steps you can do uh, intra op uh, in terms of implant choice especially at the junctions with uh, with case size or with it uh, with respect to the tissue so which tissue we have to preserve yes. on yes, table sir. so the posterior event adjacent segment degenerations right 
So the posterior tension band we should uh, preserve, sir, to okay. re reduce the um, and adjacent segment disease. And sir, uh, also uh, as minimal muscle dissection as possible to limit okay. it towards the segment. So and the interspinous ligaments and uh, should be preserved, sir. Okay. Facet capsule also you have not okay. Facet capsule. Then regarding the case size, what case size is? Uh, Recommended which, to uh, prevent which which sizes leads to increased risk so of uh, cage. so the uh, I think sir cage above more than twelve mm uh, in length sir uh, should be okay worried. and any particular implant at the junctions which will uh, uh, reduce the risk um, sir so, uh, in long segment fixation we should cover the mobile segments of the spine and implant to be used should be a, a dual thread screws. Especially. Okay, I am talking about the end. Anything used so, at yes. the end? Uh, so you can use a um, disc uh, arthroplasty. So you can do use a disc re replacement for motion segment. How many with this arthroplasty have you seen or heard <laughs> having been done in Bombay alone? No. no. Have you seen? Have you heard a lot of people doing that? No. Sir. Suppose you are doing a posterior degenerative lumbar spine, uh, uh, lumbar degenerative scoliosis. Yes, sir. So, what is the cho what is the preferred choice of implant uh, to, to reduce uh, the rigidity yes, at sir. the at the junction? So, I'll do a, a posterior uh, sir, a T lift, sir, and use a cage and pedicle screws and connecting rods, sir. For that, sir, I should prefer a, a dual thread screw, sir. How does dual thread work? Um, so dual thread has a better hold for in cases of osteoporotic bone. So in case the uh, uh, during reduction the uh, vertebra is trying to, uh, so in case the osteoporotic vertebra the screw won't get a pull out or back out. It will have a better hold, and so we can also use reduction screws sir, for degen screws. Okay. This is you are you are talking the concern about displacement from there. Your paper is on the ASD. Yes. Right, right, sir. He's talking something else. Mitre, uh, one uh, simple question that you yes. describe a lot of vectors uh, for the preoperative assessment. Now, all these vectors has any importance in selection of the implant or when it comes to selection of implant, it's basically your own concept. Uh, they play a very important role. Uh, so I would go for... Uh, Better implants, sir, and uh, so use better. No, the bone question is system. about no, no. The question is about like the factors which you suggested, the pre-operative assessment factors. Right. Do they play any role in selection of the implant? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. They do. Sir. Okay, can you give me the example? Like, if uh, these uh, factors are present, then you will go for uh, this implant, and if these factors are present, then you will go for the motion preserving implant. Yes, sir. So, uh, in case of a um, so, uh, improper uh, spinopelvic imbalance, I would like to go for a motion segment implant. It's a, and uh, so, in case of uh, a high sagittal what uh, SVA, sir, sagittal vertical axis, I would like to go for a um, short segment fixation with a cage, sir. Thank you. Maitreya, okay. yes. if the spinopelvic balance is disturbed, Yes. Would you not try to do correction at the level of the pilif or tilif that you're doing, interbody level? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I would. So that is what Dr. Thirin probably is asking you. Sorry, sir. I. Okay. 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 I think time is See, up. You... And... Yeah. Okay. You have three more candidates to thought go. Has to... Okay. Please. Yeah. So I'd like to invite now Dr. Priyanda Kumar for presenting her talk. Please share your screen. Okay, we can see your screen. Am I audible, sir? Yes, you are audible. Yes, yes. Go ahead, your screen is visible and you are audible. Good evening, respected teachers, judges, and dear colleagues. I'm Dr. Priyamada Kumar, working as a spine surgery fellow at Bombay Hospital, Mumbai. It is universal knowledge that early identification of spinal tuberculosis is the first step to combat this menace. And yet, in spite of this, the average time from presentation to diagnosis is a shocking seven months. 
This is primarily due to the ill-structured diagnostic strategies being used, especially at the grassroots levels at the PHCs. Exponential increase in immunodeficient states, emergence of atypical TB infection, and rampant rise in MDR and XDR TB strains wreck the spine by the time a delayed diagnosis is made and treatment is planned. Our aim today is to explore the research around early diagnosis of spinal TB and the effectiveness of each investigative modality. PubMed, Google Scholar, and Medline databases were searched for articles published between 2013 to 2023, and the following search terms were utilized. A total of 15 articles were included in our review today. The first step to early diagnosis is to have a high grade of clinical suspicion because the patient usually presents to us with notoriously non-specific symptoms. A person less than 20 years or more than 50 years of age residing in an endemic region for tuberculosis coming to us with inconspicuous non-mechanical back pain lasting for more than four weeks with or without paraspinal spasm should alert the clinician that he might be dealing with a case of spinal TB. Baseline tests such as BSR, CRP, HIV, CBC and alkaline phosphatase should be done, not because they are diagnostic of spinal TB, but because they effectively help in clinical reasoning. ESR can also be used as a sensitive marker to monitor the therapeutic response over time. Interferon gamma release assay or IGRA as we know it, is available in two forms, TB Gold and T-Spot, both of which measure the host immune response against three TB antigens. However, according to WHO guidelines, these tests are not recommended in TB endemic regions. MRI, specially contrast enhanced MRI, remains the gold standard imaging modality because it allows best visualization of neural compression and soft tissue spread. Whole spine screening films easily identify skip lesions and allow early institution of treatment and preclude progression to deformity. It is also prudent to do an MRI before stopping the AKT at the end of the regimen. However, if not correlated well clinically, MRIs can give a high false positive results as they are overly sensitive. CT, although highly sensitive to vertebral body changes, is not a specific investigative tool. And so in spinal TB, its role is mostly limited to guide percutaneous biopsies for the, uh, tissue diagnosis. Nuclear imaging using PET scan allows real-time assessment of disease activity. However, this is expensive and cannot differentiate between malignancy and infection, which is why it is not very frequently used for diagnosis of spinal TB. However, it can be used after initiation of AKT for interim assessment of treatment response. Conventional radiography, according to us, have no role in early diagnosis because of the low sensitivity and also because of the fact that changes are visible on X-ray only after at least 30% of bone mineral loss has already occurred. One needs to understand that none of the imaging options discussed here are reliable in distinguishing spinal infections and neoplasm, which is why tissue diagnosis is a must. Biopsy remains the gold standard investigation of choice where the sample should be sent for staining, culture, genetic testing, as well as histopathology. Biopsy can be open or percutaneous under CT or USG guidance. It is recommended that at least two trials of percutaneous biopsy should be tried before proceeding on to an open biopsy. For microbiological testing, staining can be done using ZN stain or oromine rhodomine stains. Both these tests are very specific but have a lower sensitivity rate, which especially becomes a problem in spinal TB, which is a possibacillary scenario. Bactic MGIT remains the gold standard culture modality. It is a radiometric culture assay where the readings are taken at 0, 3, and 6 weeks post-incubation. And if positive, it can give drug susceptibility to all 14 AKT drugs. It has a 100% specificity rate. But the drawback is that it has a lower sensitivity around 56%. And this is when uh, this is where gene expert and line probe assay kind of tests come into the picture. Both these tests work on the principle of DNA amplification and can provide speedy results, have a higher sensitivity as well as specificity. 
Gene expert can detect rifampicin resistance within 90 minutes, and LPA can give a diagnosis of MDR as well as XDR TB within 48 hours. However, the drawback with both these tests are that they cannot differentiate between live and dead bacilli. TB Quick is another newer modality, not very uh, widely available in India as of now. It is highly sensitive, even more so than Gene Expert because it detects shorter palindromic repeats for the genomic detection of uh, tuberculous bacilli. Histopathology is a must in all cases of tissue diagnosis. The sample should be sent for histopathology because it helps differentiate between TB granulomas against non-tuberculous granulomas and malignancy. The classical features seen are caseous necrosis, epitheloid cell granuloma, and Langdon and giant cells. This is a renowned paper by Raj Shekhar and Sir in Global Spine Journal. Again, as we see that the sensitivity and specificity for all the staining, culture, and histopathology techniques are much higher as compared to generalized tests such as blood tests and MRI, including the IGRA and the Mantu testing. To summarize the plethora of investigations, a rough algorithm like this can be followed in a clinical setup, where in case of high suspicion of clinical, uh, high clinical suspicion of spinal TB, X-ray of the affected part should be done. Although the X-ray is abnormal, if the uh, if the clinician does suspect spinal TB very highly, generalized blood tests along with a dedicated MRI and a whole spine screening should be done. If there is an emergency indication for surgery, proceed with it, procure the samples for open biopsy and send it for tissue diagnosis. If not, we can stick to percutaneous CT biopsies. Again, get the sample for tissue diagnosis and send it for all the testings, including staining, MGIT, gene expert, and histopathology. AKT should be started after a def definitive diagnosis. To conclude, diagnosis of spinal TB is a conglomeration between clinical correlation, positive imaging on MRI, and tissue diagnosis. Tissue diagnosis, again, is a multimodal approach. One cannot choose one test over the other. All the samples should be sent for ZN staining, MGIT, gene expert, as well as histopathology. These are my references for the study today. Thank you. So, thank you, Dr. Kumar. And you finished with uh, 50 seconds left in the clock. So what to judges for questions? Uh, Ingalarika, sir. Uh, miss, uh, you said CT scan has very little role in the management. Can you explain a little more about that? Uh, sir, I did not mean in the management. What I was trying to emphasize is that uh, during the early diagnostic stages, uh, the CT is not used very frequently. It is very sensitive in detecting the radiological changes, the vertebral status, the disc space changes, but uh, it is not specific to TB as such. So which is why an MRI would be a better choice of imaging modality in the earlier stage than CT. CT can be used in the later stages or when we are planning a surgical treatment to judge the level of bony destruction that has occurred. But during the early stages where we want an, a clue towards a tuberculous infection, CT has little role as compared to MRI in that scenario. Uh, when you're saying this, are you presuming that lots of your patients will come to you in reasonably quick time or early time? So you're focusing only on the early diagnosis? Uh, sir, uh, no. So the research that I had conducted today was more towards focusing on an early diagnosis. So we can prevent a scenario where patient is coming to us much later, being referred through various uh, general practitioners, taking different kind of empirical treatment, and then coming to us after considerable bony damage has already occurred. So my try today was to narrow down investigations which could detect the infection at an earlier stage. So. You said if the patient is, doesn't have an emergency reason for surgery, can you spell out what, what are those emergency reasons? So if a patient is uh, coming to me with uh, gross neurological deficit, or which is of acute onset, or a sudden which worsening. An, which is a well-established well indication. Anything? Sudden worsening of uh, neurological deficit, sir, or in case of a yes. cervical tuberculosis, if uh, there is excessive retropharyngeal collection, 
which is why the patient is coming with uh, dysphagia or uh, breathing difficulty that can be an emergency situation well this, these are these are well known well established indications what is excruciating mechanical back pain sir because uh, and when, once we do the radiological investigations if we see there are signs of instability that could be a condition where we would prefer to proceed with surgery to uh, provide some comfort for the patient because of uh, mechanical stabilization and go for an open biopsy rather than waiting it out would would mri show you that it's a grossly mechanically unstable surgery or CT scan would show CT scan would show that better. Okay. CT scan is equally important. So please stay on. Okay. Thank you, Ingar. Uh, Dr. Satyan, are you around? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I had a question, very good, well presented, uh, Dr. Premada. Uh, my question uh, was that uh, you had a very interesting line where you said uh, that uh, we start AKT only after you get a definitive diagnosis for the patient and not before. Uh, now, uh, you know, very often we get uh, cases where uh, even the histopathology, gene expert, biopsies, etc. will not give us any, uh, any positive response. And I'm sure you also come across that. In that case, what is your recommendation? So there are always situations where there is an exception. In case there is a situation where all the tests have failed, uh, simultaneously when we are sending for staining, we also send it for other pyogenic anaerobic cultures, staining. If everything has failed and clinically as well as radiologically, we have very strong suspicion of tuberculosis, then in such a case, we will have to proceed with an empirical treatment and then judge on the basis of uh, how the patient is faring symptomatically, if our approach was right or not. But apart from such ex exceptions, sir, I would suggest it's always better for the definitive diagnosis and then proceed to start the AKT. Thank you. Uh, I want. I learned something new in your presentation about uh, gene quick, TB quick. I think. Okay. Can you tell me a little bit more about it, TB quick? So TB Quick uh, also works on the principle of DNA amplification, sir. But the advantage, as compared to Gene Expert, is that uh, the code, the genomic palindromic repeat that it is uh, detecting, is much shorter. So it's much more sensitive to detect the bacterial genome in the sample. So it has a higher uh, sensitivity rate as compared to Gene Experts. And all these tests are available in Bombay, India. Uh, Dr. Deeraj, questions? Yeah. Uh, so, so Deeran, what, sir, do you you mean by, what do you mean by definitive diagnosis and what's the routine? Uh, so he asked about some exceptional scenarios. So tell me your routine when you decide uh, when to start the AKT. So routinely what we practice uh, is that when the patient comes to us, we have a clinical suspicion of tuberculosis. We are conducting the radiological investigations which are matching the symptoms and our suspicion. Again, if the patient needs immediate surgery, if the surgery would provide uh, more relief than waiting it out, then we go for an open biopsy. Uh, else, we wait for the percutaneous uh, CT-guided biopsy report, sir. And by definitive diagnosis, I mean the battery of tests that I listed. At least one of them um, giving me a positive result. Like what? So like gene expert result, it usually okay. comes... So if gene patient, expert is spotted, you start uh, the patient on AKT? Ideally, we do, sir. But uh, there again, we closely follow the MGIT report because gene expert does not give me the complete drug susceptibility. Although I'm starting the patient of, uh, to, uh, on AKT at that point of time, I keep a very thorough watch on the MGIT report because at the end of six weeks, I need that list of drug susceptibility to all 14 drugs. And uh, then again, I also keep a watch on the patient's uh, clinical symptoms. If the pain is gone, generalized well-being is there, that means my empirical treatment is working well so far. Else, something is wrong. It's resistant to one of the drugs. And that is when I will change the drug susceptibility report, change the drug regimen if need be after that. Okay. 
so uh, when you take that call you have to change the second line it, uh, when you don't get anything uh, on mgit when you take that call sir i am sorry but i haven't faced a scenario where uh, the patient is not doing so, so many I'm times saying. we get a gene expert positive but and we are not able to grow anything hmm. so again that is a scenario sir because like i said gene expert cannot differentiate between a live and dead bacilli a latent and an active infection so gene expert will be positive even if the patient has a latent infection or had a past history of infection again the past infection could have caused it suppose a patient no, is coming to understand my question i think well, see again i will repeat i think you know the answer that's what i'm repeating for you if in a case when we have got a gene expert positive so that suggests it is tuberculosis but then we haven't we are not getting culture uh, report so what time you will decide to change the drug modality or to add some more drugs or to change the line of therapy but uh, my patient is preparing well in respect to, in respect to whatever the tell me the scenarios now so what scenario will make you consider that the only scenario the first and foremost that i will look for is if the patient is doing well or not if he is faring well okay. clinically it means the treatment is working so i will not okay. bother changing my regime okay fine take okay uh, premada i am going to ask you a very oblique question and i want you to answer it scientifically would you give generic drugs or would you give branded <laughs> drugs stop the recording <laughs> okay forget about it. okay all right let let's proceed kiran sir you have a question go ahead yeah uh, we have that like the question is very practical question in the past we used to get a lot of not lot of but some patients where we have no hard evidence for tuberculosis but on a clinical ground we used to start treatment the anti tuberculosis treatment now as well as i understand that now government is very strict and on empirical basis government does not allow us to start anti tuberculosis treatment so have you come across such situation where you feel that yes this could be tuberculosis but you don't have any hard evidence to start the treatment yes sir it has happened with us a few times where uh, again the patient has come from our refer has been referred from outside is carrying a along with the symptoms along with the radiological evidence uh, he is also carrying a positive uh, tb gold test that is a spot test that is being done in a lot of institutes but still um, tb gold is not considered a scientific uh, documentation valid by the indian government and so we had to wait for uh, one of these tests to come positive before we could institute the drug therapy under our uh, would you like to recommend to the government something for such uh, patients where you don't have an evidence but still you feel that you want to start treatment so to be honest i think it is wiser to wait for a definitive diagnosis because the problem of mdr and xdr tb strains is actually becoming very worrisome and so i think it would be better to wait for a few days manage the patient with the pain with the bracing and wait for the result to come thank you thank you okay thank you thanks a lot so let's invite our next contestant dr ashish naik ashish go ahead and share your presentation Yeah. Is my screen visible, sir? It's still coming on. Yes, now it is visible. I'll start, sir. Yeah, go ahead. Your audio is good. Go ahead. Good evening to one and all present here. Myself, Dr. Ashish Naik. I'll be speaking on vertebroplasty and kyphoplasty, a review of all minimally invasive uh, treatments. So osteoporosis is basically a low bone mass and microarchitectural deterioration of the bone, which results in an increased risk of fractures. WHO defines it as BMD less than 2.5 standard deviations or more below the mean of young healthy adults. As life expectancy increases, osteoporosis increases concomitantly and spine is the most common site. So 9 million cases occur worldwide and it's an important cause of morbidity. 
as the populations are going to age, the number of such fractures are expected to rise even further. And optimal challenge is a challenge. Optimal treatment is a challenge. Osteoporotic vertebral fractures cause pronounced pain, persistent reduction of the quality of life, affect physical function as well as mental health, causing mobility and mortality, which is related to the severity of spinal deformity. Now, Sugita et al. had given a classification as per which of the swelled front up type, the bow shape, and the projective type had poor prognosis. Um, the natural history says that 70% heal by conservative line of management and 30% undergo pseudoarthrosis resulting in immobility and neurological deficit. Now, conservative treatment uh, gives good outcomes in about 70 to 80 percent of the patients. But when are these procedures needed? Uh, so, patients who are having severe acute back pain, inadequate pain relief despite an adequate conservative trial, who have comorbidities to prevent them from having a prolonged bed rest or analgesics, in such patients, such treatments are needed. Now, minimally invasive interventions allow for height reconstruction. They also allow for stabilization, relief of pain, mobilization, and functional rehabilitation. Methodology was as follows. PubMed, Cochrane Library, and MDs uh, were searched for relevant studies. The following search terms were uh, used, and studies from high impact factor journals over the last 10 years were chosen. Vertebral plus was first described by Galibert and Deramont. It's an image guided, minimally invasive procedure which involves injection of bone cement into the partially collapsed vertebra and provides pain relief and stability. The mechanism of action being it increased stiffness, stabilizes the spine, reduces the abnormal micro and macro motions, and also causes chemical neurolysis of the nerve endings. Indications been a digital type 2 and 3, which uh, has intravertebral instability, uh, acute painful OVF uh, in which immobilization cannot be done, and Kummel's disease. Contraindications been neurological deficit, asymptomatic fractures, digital type 4 and 5, which have intervertebral instability, infective etiology, allergic coagulopathy, vertebra plana, and a severely compromised respiratory function. Kyphoplasty is basically evolution of vertebroplasty, which involves inflating a balloon inside the vertebral body. To restore the vertebral height, reduce the kyphotic deformity, and thus improve the spinal biomechanics. The balloon is first inflated, then it's inflate, deflated and removed, and cement is injected into the void to maintain the structural integrity. The injection of low pressure cement reduces the risk of cement leakage. Indications and contraindications are similar. One important difference being it cannot be done for acute, it can only be performed for acute fractures up to seven to uh, 10 days and up to a maximum of four to six weeks. In older fractures, it's difficult to achieve adequate vertebral height restoration and kyphosis correction. Approach about D9, it's a transcostal vertebral approach, and in thoracolumbar and lumbar, it's a transpedicular approach. Uh, pressure means 150 psi for fresh fractures, a um, maximum of 300 psi can be done by unilateral or bilateral porters. Uh, benefits for unilateral means shorter operative times, lesser radiation exposure, and lower complication rates. No significant differences between vas and ODI scores, improvement of kyphosis angle, and correction of spinal deformity. Uh, now, vertebral cortical defects it will result in cement leakages, and which thus, in such cases, the procedure should be terminated to avoid complications. Herein, the extra link comes into place, which prevents the massive cement leakages through these cortical defects. Uh, precisely defects are located, balloon will be inflate, deflated and removed, cannula strategically positioned near this defect, little cement is injected to cover the defect bilaterally. The kyphoplasty balloons will be then reinserted and slowly reinflated to press the cement against the defect and then we can go ahead with the vertebroplasty or kyphoplasty. Uh, the drawbacks of kyphoplasty are it causes displacement and damage to the termiculae with the balloon inflation. Uh, the loss of restored height can take place when balloon has been deflated and cement has been filled and there is a risk of cement leakage. Now, radiofrequency kyphoplasty has a unique hydraulic pressure delivery system. It has an articulating osteotome which creates channels within the vertebral body and simultaneously creates <coughs> and filling of it is possible. Uh, now, in terms of uh, outcomes, it stabilizes fractures and restored vertebral, uh, restores the vertebral body height. Uh, Lordoplasty uh, depends on the principle of ligamento taxis. It's basically vertebral plastic performed at adjacent vertebrae Cement cannulas are in situ. We are used to apply the lordotic moment. Facets act as a fulcrum. And after maximum possible reduction, the fractured vertebra is augmented. Outcomes are comparable to vertebroplasty and kyphoplasty. Vesuvioplasty is an alternative in which a balloon container is uh, inserted. And on inflation, it creates a cavity. And the bone cement is injected into this contained cavity, which limits the risk of leakage and maintains the reduction of fracture and provides stability. Now, it has similar pain relief and vertebral compression recovery, but it has lower spinal leakage, cement leakage. 
Uh, spine jack is basically a device which is inserted by transpedicular approach. Now, the deployment results in fracture reduction and kyphosis restoration. There is no damage to surrounding trabeculae. The fracture has to be mobile. Injection of the bone cement helps to secure a long-term reduction. Main advantage is end plate restoration, which decreases the incidence of progressive collapse. Key wise, another special delivery tool which positions an inertal guide wire. The implant is inserted and the guide wire is withdrawn and bone cement is injected into the implant. It is superior to vertebroplasty and kyphoplasty as decreases incidence of cement leakage and maintains the kyphosis angle. Uh, cement uh, and alternatives. Most commonly, a PMA uh, based cement is used. Wide varieties are available based on the surviving agent, viscosity, the working time, and exothermic reaction. Other new types are coming up. Uh, complications can be intraoperative or uh, postoperative. Uh, now, what is the latest data? So, across here, evidence has shown the patients who are subjected to a more rigorous selection and those with severe pain treated less than six weeks from fracture onset are good candidates for vertebroplasty and kyphoplasty. And this has been validated in multiple RCTs. Uh, in terms of outcomes, pain relief in acute uh, OVF is 90%, chronic being 80 to 100 percent. Mobility in acute is 84 to 93 percent, chronic being 50 to 88 percent, and reduced requirement of analysis in 91 percent. Two trials uh, by the et al. and Calmus et al. Uh, said that these are basically sham procedures and they are not superior to placebo. But it was found that they basically included chronic fractures and pre-procedure MRI was not done. Uh, now, the vapor trial and Wotos trial, which are basically multi-center, double-line RCTs, prove that these procedures are superior to placebo and pain reduction in these patients does occur. In terms of vertebroplasty and kyphoplasty, uh, I mean, on comparison, this meta-analysis shows us that clinically there are no differences between the two. Radiographically, kyphoplasty is better. In terms of complication, cement leakage does is lower in terms of kyphoplasty, but other complications are almost the similar. In terms of intraoperative resource consumption, vertebroplasty has smaller amount of volume injected, a shorter operative time, fewer fluoroscopy times, lower operation cost, and the volume of blood loss is also smaller. Thus, to summarize, Osteoporotic factors, uh, fractures have a benign natural history. The primary indication has to be a painful OVF, which is refracted to adequate non-operative treatment, or acute fractures uh, who have severe pain and blood loss is not advisable. Absolute contraindications with infection, intervertebral instability, and uncontrolled coagulopathy. Major complications are uncommon, but cement embolism and cement leakage can occur. It has a success rate of about 95%. Thus, proper patient selection is vital. The first step is to confirm that the collapse vertebra is the source of the pain. Next step is to exclude the other causes and finally to rule out the intervertebral inst instability, which may require instrumented stabilization. Future research can be on artificial intelligence and augmented reality, bioactive PMA and biomaterials for augmentation, customized bioabsorbable and bone forming materials. These are my references. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ashish. And you took around. 30 seconds more to finish. Okay, so sir. let's invite the judges for questions. Inger Alikar, sir, over to you, sir. Yes. Uh, evening, can sir. you tell me which of these various methods that you described, they are yes, truly sir. biologically healing methods, biologically healing, as against uh, buttressing or supporting it will depend upon the cement uh, injected, sir. Uh, See, is is the cement a biologically active? Uh, no, substance? sir. Biologically active uh, uh, cements are coming up, but as of uh, uh, now, we are currently using the PMA based uh, cements. Which are not, which are most shortly buttressing the defect and filling the defect and not biologically active. They are not uh, healing the fractures uh, biologically, but basically just causing the height restoration uh, and biomechanically improving. As of now, we are not uh, using any cements which will uh, heal the fractures biologically. So the bone of that particular body, upper part and lower part, yes, with sir. a blob of cement in between. Where's yes, the sir. biological bond? It's only buttressing? Yeah, it's uh, buttressing. Buttressing uh, mechanically, sir. But because the height has been uh, restored, so that would uh, help the patient in terms of pain relief and help in mobilization, which would be our ultimate goal in search. Is, is that the reason for pain relief? The pain, many patients whose fracture collapses and heals. So the angle is not changed, like you say. And yes, the sir. patients have zero pain. So, do you think this angle is what gives the pain? No, sir. The and angle is the angle gives relief. 
no sir not the angle but uh, the natural history is uh, important so like 70% will uh, be uh, healing on their own by terms of conservative uh, management the 30% no, no, we all know we yes. all know about it yes You're sir talking about this what is the biological thing suppose you follow your vertebroplasty 6 months 1 year 2 year what do you see there um there will be what do you see what is the long term benefit or short term middle term benefit of a short term benefit would be in terms of uh, pain relief, relief of pain sir. complete yes. completely agree with you completely agree. uh long term sir basically we are just helping the uh, patient to overcome so these procedures are indicated only when there is intra vertebral instability so we are just uh, helping the patient to overcome the uh, symptomatic uh, pain period after which the body's natural healing response will take over and the patient will recover sir so we are have actually seen, just buttressing and sorry sir have you seen displaced cements i have uh, seen sir uh, but uh, not in my institute sir uh, cement leakages i have seen sir not leakages displacement of a solidified buttress uh, no sir i have not seen sir i have not seen sir okay. Okay. no sir okay sir dr satyan you are on yeah yeah okay. so a uh, uh, good uh, presentation uh, ashish uh, Thank you, i sir. wanted to ask you Uh, about uh, one point which you said that where vesseloplasty is uh, superior to vertebroplasty and phacoplasty uh, uh, this my first yes, question sir. is on this okay, yeah okay explain can you explain on that uh, so it uh, my point was that it, uh, it it's better in terms of uh, reducing the uh, amount of cement leakage so now cement leakage could be symptomatic or asymptomatic but uh, in terms of cement leakage it is better uh, The which is the which, shown that which there is the is... main indication for doing uh, a procedure vertebroplasty cartilaginous vessel anything what is the main indication for doing this uh basically sir uh, two three uh, fractures who have acute uh, painful uh, fractures and the patient uh, cannot be localized having so you were doing it in acute fracture uh vertebroplasty sir yes Yes, sir. Uh, like if the patient is uh, like initially, if a patient comes to me, I will offer him conservative line of uh, management. But suppose the conservative line of management cannot be done, like it fails after an adequate conservative trial. Also, the patient. Uh, What is adequate? Is uh, about uh, like two, three to four weeks of uh, conservative trial of uh, ma- management, uh, in which the pain uh, is the vast and odious scores of the patient are uh, having a decreasing trend. Uh, the patient is able to uh, mobilize like. Uh, patient should have be given a bed rest only for a few amount of days after which he should be able to mobilize at least with a brace if he is not able to do that uh, not able to carry it out his activities of uh, daily living he has been confined to his bed most of these fractures will take place in uh, elderly people so if he has been confined to bed uh, all those uh, mobility and mortality See, i'll tell you i'll go i'll go back to you your put in your put on indications you have actually presented in your indications yes. which was your number one indication for doing this procedure a very acute painful osteoporotic no, uh, no, no, vertebral no, no, fracture no 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 go back to your presentation what was your main indication the digo 2 and 3 uh, uh, fracture sir okay okay theek hai forget it yes okay uh, doctor ashish are you are you aware of the fact that the yes, incidence sir? of vertebroplasty over last 10 years or 20 15 years is reducing yes sir why uh so initially uh, like when vertebroplasty came it was being applied and people were seeing uh, good results but then it uh, came on to be applied to like multiple uh, places like multiple uh, fractured vertebra uh, were, and then the uh, basically patient selection was uh, not been appropriate and then it led to a lot of complications also it was observed that even with conservative treatment uh, the patients do improve naturally so we are just uh, trying to uh, overcome the painful period for the uh, patient you said it's contraindicated in infections ah uh, yes sir uh, as per have literature you, have you seen people using cement in presence of some infection i have seen sir uh, i was uh, talking just in terms of vertebroplasty sir 
I mean, uh, even if there's a spondylodiscitis or surgical site infection, then we do use antibiotic uh, beaded uh, cements. But I've not specifically uh, seen a vertebroplasty or kyphoplasty being used in terms of, uh, uh, say, surgical okay. site infection or spondylodiscitis. All right. All right. Okay, Dr. Yes. Dhiraj, so, your questions. So, uh, Ashish, yes, so what are your cases where both this uh, uh, vertoplasty as well as kyphoplasty won't work? And what what's uh, the other modalities uh, will be uh, so what, the, How you select in osteoporotic fracture, you won't go for a vertoplasty as well as kyphoplasty? Uh, so, if there is a Dijo 4 5 uh, type of fractures, which basically means an intervertebral instability, is that the PLC is uh, damaged. Uh, in that terms, uh, a short a short or long segment instrumentation has will have to be done along with uh, augmentation. If there is a neurological deficit, then definitely we have to decompress the spine. In that, uh, we will not be able to use, just use uh, uh, vertebroplasty or kyphoplasty. If there is an allergy to uh, cement, if there is a uh, severely compromised pulmonary uh, function, uh, in all such cases, sir, we will not be able to go ahead with vertebroplasty or uh, kyphoplasty. So, what, what, so how you will augment uh, the vertebra? Uh, like a short segment or a long segment instrumentation. Instrumentation. Uh, yes, sir. Instrumentation. Apart from that. Yeah. Uh, sir, like uh, if osteoporotic fractures, we can uh, the we can use a cortical bone trajectory, which was described by Santorini. Uh, we can use uh, longer screws or larger segment uh, fixation. All this can be uh, used to augment uh, if a uh, cement based procedure cannot be used. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah. yeah, Ashish, uh, like if someone comes to you, some Good company, name. and says that uh, we want to improve the cement, so what will be your suggestions for improving the cement? Because some of the complications are related due to um, cement quality. Yes. So, what will be your suggestions? Uh, my suggestion would be, sir, if you could uh, develop a more uh, cement which is more biologically active, which is bioresorbable, uh, so that uh, uh, which is also inductive and conductive. So once the fracture heals, the uh, basically bone will form and an actual healing will more take place. Uh, that would be my suggestion, sir. Okay, good, good. And uh, anything about the stiffness? Would you think that reducing the stiffness would help us in reducing the yes uh, if you could reduce complications the, yes if you could reduce the stiffness sir uh, then asd uh, like could be avoided sir okay thank you thank you sir. okay so thanks judges and thanks for the ashish we would like to invite our uh, last contestant today let me see here already The last contestant is here, Dr. Kushal. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm your, am I audible, yeah. sir? Yeah, yeah. Dr. Kushal, yeah. go ahead and share your presentation. Yeah, uh, sure. Dr. Ashok, uh, Shula, the, all the contestants should be present at present uh, or they can leave? No, they can leave. Uh, so other contestant uh, who have already spoken can leave now. Hello, hello. Good evening, everyone. Is my screen visible? Yes, your screen is visible and you're audible. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my topic for today's presentation is laminectomy versus laminoplasty, a comparative review of techniques and outcomes. Uh, these are my disclosures. So let me start with this case example. This 60-year-old male who presented with spastic tetraparesis with a motor power of 2 to 3 by 5 in all four limbs with bilateral hand grip weakness with MGO score of 6, barely able to stand and walk. X-ray shows a neutral spine with some lordosis on extension. MRI is showing a significant cord, anterior cord compression from C2 to C6. And coming to CT scan, we can see that there is a, a mixed type of OPLL which you can appreciate. Coming to the second case, another similar patient, a 65-year-old male with spastic tetraparesis with all four limb power of about 3 to 4 by 5 and MGO score of 6, barely able to walk with walker support. However, on x-ray, we can see that there is a fairly maintained cervical lordosis. MRI is showing multi-level spondylotic changes with significant anterior cord compression. So, uh, these both cases are having similar case presentation, but they have different etiologies with different cervical spine alignment. 
So what should be the ideal treatment? Whether one should do laminoplasty or laminectomy? So literature is very clear whether one should do an anterior procedure or a <laughs> posterior procedure. But there is a dilemma regarding what type of posterior procedure. So therefore, we conducted this review to compare the safety and efficacy of laminoplasty versus laminectomy with regards to clinical, radiological, and surgical outcomes, and also to compare and study their surgical complications. So we searched all these data bases with PRISMA guidelines followed and all studies published until September 2023, which compared laminoplasty and laminectomy for degenerative cervical myelopathy were included in this review. Just an overview of these techniques. So laminoplasty is a technique in which we drill traps on both the sides and lamina is elevated on one side, which helps in the posterior migration of the cord and decompression. So this is the open door technique. In French door technique, a midline split of the lamina is done. And finally, the fixation is secured with the help of many fragment plates. So laminectomy is the procedure in which we remove on block the posterior lamina. It may be supplemented with the instrumented posterior lateral fusion. So coming back to the methodology and selection criteria, all randomized control trials or observational studies that compared clinical outcomes between laminoplasty and laminectomy with or without fusion were included in this review. So as per PRISMA guidelines, we recorded 587 records through database searching and after identification and screening, a total of 15 studies were included in this review. Parameters assessed included <coughs> surgical, clinical, radiological parameters and C5 palsy and complications were also recorded, which are enlisted here. So this master chart shows all the studies which we reviewed. Total of 15 studies were reviewed of which there were three RCTs and these were the parameters which I recorded the mean follow-up range from 8.8 .8 to 72 months. So coming to the results, the uh, post-operative JOA score and WAS scores and surgical outcomes were comparable in both the groups. However, we found that post-operative cervical curvature index and neck disability index laminoplasty showed better results. So C5 palsy rates were higher in laminectomy group. Superficial infection rate occurred significantly less in laminoplasty group. Other complications were comparable Overall, laminectomy without, without fusion had higher complications. So coming to the overview of techniques, cervical laminoplasty is used to treat multi-level cervical spondylotic changes, multi-level OPLL. Hirabayashi was the first who described the open door technique. The video demonstrates the open door technique of cervical laminoplasty in which troughs are created on both the sides and open door lamina is open, which is fixed with the help of many fragment plates. And advantages are that, that it maintains a greater degree of motion. And because of maintenance of the protective covering over the spinal canal, there is reduced formation of a post laminectomy membrane, which over time uh, prevents the late onset neuro deficit, which happens. There are three techniques which are described for laminoplasty, open door technique, French door technique, and a T-saw technique. So the ideal candidates for laminoplasty are symptomatic multi-level spinal cord compression with a straight or a lordotic cervical spine with minimal axial plane. Relative contraindications include kyphosis and segmental instability. So most patients require a C3 to C6 laminoplasty. Viterbo et al. recommended doing a C2 and a C7 lamino, uh, dome osteotomy while performing this laminoplasty so that the spinal cord can drift posteriorly without getting kinked at this lamina. Complications include epidural hematoma, infection, post-laminectomy, kyphosis, decreased <clears throat> range of motion. Axial neck pain, however, is more common in C3 to C7 cases as more compared to C3 to C6. C5 palsy occurs with the incidence of 15 to 16% in laminoplasty. However, most cases recover within six months to one year with physiotherapy. Another technical uh, complication which is encountered is a laminar closure, which can occur in around 5% of cases and non-unionate hinge side, which can occur in 9% cases. Coming to cervical laminectomy, the main uh, advantage is that we can decompress the cord under direct vision and bilateral foraminotomies with the laminectomy width of more than 15 mm decreases the risk of C5 palsy. When added with instrumented fusion, it also prevents progression of OPLL. Main disadvantages of this technique is that it has increased post-operative axial leg pain with high rate of infection and high C5 palsy rates. When laminectomy is performed alone, there is an increased risk of post-laminectomy instability and kyphosis. For example, in this case, this was a 69-year-old male who underwent laminectomy only. At two years follow-up, he presented with C3-4 instability with kyphosis and worsening myelopathy. 
so these posterior techniques rely on the posterior shift of the cord posterior spinal cord drift helps in the indirect decompression of the spine in a lordotic cervical spine so this case example of a 69 year old male at one year follow up mri shows adequate posterior drift with c who underwent a c3 to c6 laminectomy and improved clinical results so in cases with preserved lordosis laminoplasty is a good option and in flexible kyphosis laminectomy with instrumented fusion should be chosen so these two case examples they compare laminoplasty with laminectomy here we can see that both patients improved clinically and adequate posterior drift of the cord is seen with good mri results as well so these recent advances a recently advised technique of laminoplasty with fusion can be considered in patients with local kyphosis and opl with segmental instability it gives advantages of both these techniques limitations of this review were that we only included three rcts there were twelve observational studies with level three evidence. The studies were heterogeneous with respect to patient population, etiologies, different surgical techniques, and different follow-up time. And this was a narrative review, but did not do a meta-analysis. Thus, to conclude, both laminoplasty and laminectomy are effective techniques to improve outcomes in DCM. Laminoplasty had better results as compared to laminectomy in various parameters. Laminectomy with fusion had higher complication rates, including higher rate of C5 palsy. One must always consider free operative sagittal cervical alignment before considering surgery for degenerative cervical myelopathy. And in OPLL, laminoplasty preserves range of motion and improves neck flexibility. However, laminectomy and fusion, it suppresses the progression of OPLL. So these are my references. And I would thank you all for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Kushal. You finished 30 seconds before time. Now over to judges. Single article, sir. Over to you, sir. Uh, Kushal, uh, you have worked in spine surgery and you, I'm sure you must have seen laminectomies. Were you unhappy with them? Kushal, can you hear me? Kushal, can you hear uh, Your voice is inaudible, sir. Can you hear me? Can you Kushal, hear can you hear me? Hello. Yes, sir. Now, okay. Yes, sir. You are audible now, sir. Uh, you are given a literature review, uh, but you yourself must have seen laminectomies. Are you saw only laminoplasties? Yes, sir. What have you seen more, laminoplasties yes, or laminectomies? Sir, I have seen laminectomies with fusion. Laminectomies rarely uh, I have seen. Very rare. Uh, on rare occasions, I have seen just laminectomies. I have seen laminectomies with fusion, instrumented fusion. With fusion. But you have not seen as many laminoplasties. I have seen equal number of laminoplasties as well, sir. Okay. Uh, who uh, Are you convinced that if after laminoplasty, Cervical mobility is good? Sir, uh, in both the techniques, including uh, laminoplasty also, we find that the range of motion at one year follow-up decreases, but around 30% decrease in the range of motion. But when we compare it with laminectomy and fusion, there is significant reduction in range of motion. No, no, once you've so, done fusion, you've done fusion. You cannot yes, compare yes. fusion with a non-fusion. Sir, in laminectomy only, plain laminectomy also, there is a reduction in the range of motion. But who, who, also with laminoplasty, I have seen that there is reduced motion. Who, who says that? That the reduction in the mobility. In fact, I think the best best mobility, if at all you want, is the laminectomy. Laminectomy, yes, sir. For the best range of movement. They have near normal movement. Yes, sir. How common is C5 palsy? C5 palsy can occur in about 5 to 15 percent of cases, sir, of cases undergoing posterior decompression surgeries. But is that related to under vision, non vision? If if it see if it can happen under open vision, laminoplast, laminectomy, can it not happen under the closed laminoplasty? Non vision. Yes, sir. It definitely happens with it because both these procedures they rely on the posterior drift of the cord. So when the drift happens, the C5 nerve root, which is present at the apex of the lordosis, gets stretched. So this results in the traction palsy of the C5 nerve root. So it can happen with both the procedures, sir. 
Well, let me tell you that that palsy is not that common. Some people do have C5 pain or some dysesthesia, yes, sir. but yes, palsy sir. per se is not common in none of the procedures unless the surgeon is a very ruffian. Uh, let's move on to Dr. Dheeraj. Dheeraj, go on. Yeah. Uh, so you have mentioned a lot of benefits of la uh, laminoplasty. Tell me a few drawbacks of laminoplasty against laminectomy. Sir, a few drawbacks would include uh, that there is uh, there can be a closure of the laminoplasty, which we have opened and fixed with many plates. Right. So that is one of the uh, drawbacks. Also, during surgery, a technical complication which can happen is fracture at the opening of the hinge. So that fracture fragment can dip against the spinal cord and cause neuro deficit. So that, that is another important also, complication right, which right. one needs. Yes. Good. Good. Okay. How so easy it is to uh, put a screw in the lamina or in the lateral mass during vertebral, uh, sorry, laminoplast. What is the diameter? What is the thickness of the lamina there? Sir, we usually put the screws in the spinous process and the lamina. So the spinous process is quite thick and we get a good hold. And the lateral mass, definitely we get good hold in the lateral mass, sir. You put it in the spinous process yes, and, and in the lateral mass. In the lateral mass and in the intervening part of the lamina where it is thick, where both the lamina are connecting, we put the screws there. So that is almost around four to five mm thick, sir. We can put uh, around good screws, sir. You have not seen loosening of those implants? Sir, uh, we definitely, uh, if the initially the hold is good and uh, if the screws are in good position, intraoperatively I have not seen, but postoperatively I have seen the plates coming off and the closure of the laminoplasty which has happened. So How soon sometimes do you it does them? happen, sir, in a How few cases. How soon do you mobilize them? Sir, laminoplasty, we usually uh, give them a soft color and after suture removal, within uh, depending upon the patient's pain, we usually mobilize them within three to four weeks. Up to two weeks, sir, we give them a soft color and then we start mobilization, sir. After Till two the weeks, you start sir. the soft color also? Yes, sir. So you are heavily depending on the mechanical strength of a plate or a screw against the lamina, correct? Sir, not just the plate because we have preserved the posterior structures. We are not disappearing the posterior. Those, those are soft tension. tissue structures. They don't give stability. And especially if you are trying to mobilize one segment against the other segment, do you think such a small flimsy thing would hold? I have seen large so number the, of uh, displaced implants and failed aminoblasties. So large uh, number of them. Yes, they, that does happen, sir. But the moment which happens, it happens in the sagittal plane. There is uh, so that what about rotation? The implant is low. What about rotation? Rotations also so one yes, of the most can. common moment next to flexion. The rotation. Yes. Rotations. I sir, would but I have not those. So, okay. but uh, we usually follow this oh. protocol and we have found good results, sir. So, uh, tell me where fusion happens in laminoplasty. Sir, the fusion happens at the hinge where we have opened the door of the laminoplasty. The fusion happens at the hinge. So, uh, if the hinge is right. fused nicely, which takes almost three to six months, then usually the closure does not happen. Right, right. So, uh, tell me how in cases so you where, told about, yeah, tell me, complete, complete. So uh, also in cases where uh, recently some people have advised use of spacer where we open the lamina. So if the spacer is used, that is another place where fusion can happen along with the plate. Okay. So tell me uh, conceptually, anyway, we are decompressing uh, the posterior elements, uh, removing the posterior elements and opening uh, the canal posteriorly. Uh, we, there is a breach in the posterior ligamentous complex anyway. Yes, sir. We, we are opening the lamina, so from suppose from C3 to 6, we have opened up. There is yes. a disconnection between C2 and C3, as well as C6 yes. and C7. Okay, so posterior ligamentous complex is breached. So how how uh, how does it prevents uh, what in long term you mentioned, reduces the kyphosis part. Uh, anyway, there is a, a breach in the posterior ligamentous complex now. Yes. 
sir uh, to answer this uh, we have preserved the spinous process and the lamina as contrast to laminectomy where we remove the lamina so uh, after preservation of this posterior bony structures the muscle and the ligaments they attach on this uh, bed of the bony structure of the spinous process and the lamina which uh, over the period of time get uh, muscle attachment of this structures so that helps preventing in the long term complications of neck pain axial pain and also helps in uh, reducing the neck disability uh, have you seen post operative mris of such patients yes sir we find lot of fibrosis there posteriorly which probably prevents the flexion attitude rather sir, than uh, we do see but uh, sir usually we perform the mri at one year to see the so that uh does not in the initial period we do find sub edema and but in at one year follow up sir uh, we did uh, the mri does show some that fibrosis time you but pay not very attention much. only to the expansion of the cord you don't look at other things yes no sir we do sir we we have all the cuts we have a parasagittal cut as well and a axial cut as well of the mri okay. which shows all that right. the muscle has attached well to the lamina sir okay, okay. all right a uh, last question uh, so what are the theories uh, which leads to c5 palsy and can we do something uh, predict it preoperatively and do something intraop also to prevent this sir as i mentioned earlier that c5 nerve root uh, lies at the apex of the lordosis and all these posterior techniques rely on the posterior drift of the cord the posterior fall back of the cord also so when the posterior fall back happens there is a traction on the c5 root which causes uh, c5 traction injury also the course of the c5 root is pretty straight and uh, shorter nerve root is present so all these factors together predispose c5 nerve root more to getting palsy and c5 radiculopathy and to address your second question intraoperatively in cases uh, where we do lamino laminectomy we can perform bilateral foraminotomies and uh, prevent that uh, complication second technique is uh, when we are doing a laminectomy and fusion we should not contour the rods laminate uh, which we are placing so we should fix the rod in the neutral if the spine is neutral we should fix the rod in neutral we should not even uh, uh, extended uh, lordosis to the rod so this contributes to the palsy and third we can use intraoperative methylprednisolone where we are doing decompression use of steroids intraoperatively has shown to reasonably reduce the incidence of c5 palsy at the time of decompression if administered viren sir any question yeah um the kushal the you have done a wonderful literature review my yes sir simple sir. question is uh, for which indication you suggest laminoplasty and for which indications you suggest laminectomy okay sir as i described earlier we take into account the cervical lordosis and the cervical alignment based on x ray and also the type of compression if there is a so for coming to the alignment if the alignment of the spine is neutral or if there is a flexible kyphosis so in extension we are getting a good lordotic spine so i would go with uh, laminectomy and fusion while if the cervical lordosis is well maintained then definitely a laminoplasty is a good option secondly also the type of compression and the etiology opll seem to be doing better with laminoplasty only and in cases of multi level spondylotic myelopathy uh, both the options are laminectomy yes but also sir again here there are two schools of thought for laminoplasty there are some proponents who suggest that uh, laminoplasty is better and other proponents who suggest that there in multi level opll if we are doing motion preservation it can lead to uh, progression of opll they recommend doing a laminectomy and fusion to prevent the progression of opll also what's the level of evidence for that for laminectomy and fusion and sir, prevention uh, the of the level of evidence is level 3 studies yes sir these are only level 3 studies sir uh, we don't have a solid evidence to prove this sir okay. good great okay. okay okay thank you very much thank so we you we come to an end to the session and i think thank all of so them much. presented really well yes. this the literature yeah. review quite thoroughly yes so yes. congratulations to all of you spine is a bright future i think yeah, yeah. so the last at the end of the session every session we invite yes, the only say boys have a bright future the girl also So, no, I said spine has a bright. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's not boys.
So at the end of every she's, session, she's, she's already a star, sir. She has think, won two prizes. All, all of them, all of them have worked hard. All of them presented well. Na, unnis bis hai. Okay. So like uh, I was saying, at the end of every session, we invite the judges to share some uh, remarks to encourage them who are presented today and who will be presenting in the future also. And regarding this uh, BOS Rising Star uh, concept and the event. One, one, so, one point I would like to, like Sham says, yes, so, one point I would like to make here is you people are youngsters. You don't have your own experience, a lot of your own experience. So you're obviously basing your opinions, your thoughts on the literature. Agreed. But when you try to defend those papers, be careful. Very often, you cannot defend them well if you are asked questions. Therefore, you say, sir, this is what is said in the literature. This is what literature says. You don't try to authenticate that by supporting or trying to defend it. Because then you can be smashed. Therefore, when you review literature, you just speak square. Also, we expect you, people after having read the literature, having studied all those uh, uh, meta analysis, etc., to still form your own, own opinion. Your opinion may be youngster's opinion. It may be slightly inexperienced opinion. But do give your opinion, not calling that as your opinion, but saying, rationally speaking, I feel this is what could be done. And I, I, I would love any one of you making that kind of a statement, sir, taking into consideration all these papers, all these experiences through the world. I, I feel the uh, most rational thing to do or probably rational thing to do is to do A, B, C, D. I would be happy to hear that kind of a presenting point or presenting direction from you people. Because that gives you credibility that you also have thought of your own, which you're putting in. And now onwards, we don't want these presentations like an undergraduate or PG will give. You are consultants. And your presentation has to be consultant's presentation. And when we say that, we want your opinion, well weighted, well thought of, added to that. Okay. Your comments, Thiraj? No, I, I, the, the, the way they have all have presented, I'm quite impressed with uh, all of them. Even uh, at uh, during that uh, time, uh, when I was at their age, I won't able to uh, present so nicely what they have done. So I'm quite uh, impressed with the way everybody has uh, prepared. And uh, yeah, what uh, I have nothing to add with this uh, present program. I'm quite happy with this. Uh, uh, only good. thing we can do next time we can take uh, their own publications or research work also, and we can discuss on them uh, that if at all if required. Otherwise, the way this program is, it's uh, it's good overall. Yeah, and obviously they won't have any experience uh, uh, of their own. They have to rely on the literature. Kiran, sir? Yeah, uh, the first, the good point is like all have a wonderful presentation skill. Like they presented their ideas, their views really well. The only suggestion is like uh, some of the slides were really with a small font and they were really difficult to read. So I would suggest that please follow the rule of five lines in a slide and not more than five words in a line. That is a standard formula. And see, by increasing the number of slides, we don't pay anything in PowerPoint. So it's very important that your text should be visible to the last person, who, the person who is sitting in the last row should be visible. So that's the only thing. And I wish you all the best for future. Thank you, sir. Ashok, I would like to one more point. I just yes, sir. Go ahead. See, uh, uh, we did find that some of the candidates focus their talk only around what they had studied in those series and etc. If you are talking on a point or say vertebroplasty, I'm just giving example. I'm not saying about vertebroplasty. Then 
when you present this, you must know everything around the vertebral capacity, irrespective of what those papers you are summarizing and presenting. Because if you're going to be asked questions, you should be able to answer everything concerning those areas, not only what has been presented in that. What probably happened with one or two people is they only stuck to what they have studied in those papers and spoke only around that. Compared to that, some people spoke very largely around those topics, which I liked. That means they were knowledgeable about that. I'm sorry I'm taking the name, but when Priyamvada spoke about TB spine, uh, I got a feeling that she knew what everything about what she was talking well, some of you did not give me that feeling. Uh, I mean, now that the result has been already sealed, uh, I'm taking her name. Priyamvata, don't consider that you have been selected as the first because I said this. Okay. But we, I could make out that she knew everything about TB, test, everything about that, and she's... Now, that is something which we expect when you are presenting any paper, any preparations, any meta-analysis, any studies like this. You must be sound like a dada in that. Right, sir. Yeah. So, in the end, I'd like to invite uh, Dhar, sir, to say a few words, thank the judges, and invite for Vaira. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Ashok. Thank you, judges, uh, for... Uh, uh, providing your time in the evening, busy evenings and giving credibility to this competition and encouraging these young guys who with their amazing presentations, uh, uh, that, that is the whole point of this competition that we push these young guys to the forefront of this academic, uh, the, what is the jungle and so that they have faith in themselves also and we as seniors uh, sort of get reveal them out to the whole world and probably push them five years ahead what they would normally take i'm sure they would they are talented and they would have anyway come out on the open but this bos is trying to provide a little flip to their uh, uh, their abilities so they would present it faster so you will be an i'm sure you will all be inspiration to the now probably as dr Dirain was also saying that there are competitions coming all over the country now. So you are predecessors to all this and I'm sure you will remember this as in the long run of your career. So thank you very much everyone for being there. I'm sure we are building up to an amazing competition to, in the Wairock and see you there all and I'm sure we'll have a good time there. Back to our show. Thank you, VTI, sir, and thank you, Dhiren, and, uh, and Dr. Dhiren, Dr. Dheeraj, and Dr. Satyan. Thank, you, sir. thank you very much, sir. We have a wire up video to play for all of you. Thanks again, everyone, and we come to the end of this program. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very Thank much. You, sir. Good, Good night. night sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good night.